Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. Hebrews chapter 11 will be our um, text today. You could probably find Hebrews chapter 11 with your eyes closed by now, can't you? So sad today, though, because we come to the end. There's going to be a couple more sermons, but you can't preach chapter 11 without also preaching the first part of chapter 12. It, they all, it all works together. Actually, the end of 10 through the beginning of 12 is a really nice piece. We're going to see how some of that works together today. But we're going to begin our reading in verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 11. And what shall I say, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, of Gideon, of of Barak, and of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. I'm going to call this the report card of faith. It ends, basically, it's the concluding section of chapter 11. And you notice how he begins, what shall I, say, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of, and then he gives us this list. Dr. Schreiner, in his commentary on the book of Hebrews, says, faith trusts God in triumphs and tragedies, in the highs and lows of life. Faith gives itself entirely to God. And that's really what we see in this section of chapter 11. Let's just tuck right in here and and get started. Look at verse 32. What shall I more say? And then he gives us this list. Time would fail me to tell of, number one, Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. Now, if you look at this list... It's out of order, isn't it? I think all of us have a little touch of obsessive-compulsive. We're a little obsessive-compulsive. And we look at the list and we say, how, 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 come, that's, how, come, he doesn't have, uh, how come he doesn't have Barak before Gideon? And how come he doesn't have Jephthah before Samuel? Because that's Samson. That's the way they, they occur. So you have these heroes, basically, here from judges and from kings mentioned, or judges and Samuel mentioned here, and... And you, there, there's just a little bit out of order, but, but that's not his intention. His, he's just giving you examples. You know, I could go on and talk about Gideon. Maybe that's just the first one that crossed his mind, you know, as he's, as he's writing down this list. I could go on and talk about, but I need to restrain my pen because I've said enough already. You understand. You get the picture. And we do. Because now, after we've gone through the schooling and faith in chapter 11, we know that faith in combination with God's word, is a powerful thing. It has to rest on the word of God. There is no such thing as faith in faith or faith in myself or faith in someone else. We can put it there, but it's not secure. Faith is only secure when it rests on the foundation of God's word. And we've seen that time and time again. So he's, like I said, he's going to restrain his pen here. He's, he says, I can keep on talking and I want to keep on talking. I want to tell you about Gideon. Well, This is a particularly wonderful moment for us to look at these details and maybe plumb them for more information about this faith walk. We could go to Gideon's story in Judges chapter 6 and find out where he placed his faith. What was the word of God to him? We could go to Barak's story. 
in Judges chapter 4 and see his relationship with Deborah and the word of God that came to him through the prophetess. We could go to Samson's story, Judges chapter 13 through 16, and we could see Samson and all of his miscues and all of his misfires, but how the Lord used him and where he placed his faith. We could look at Jephthah, the one who was the most unlikely to be a judge because he's the son of a harlot, in Judges chapter 11 and 12, and see that God mightily used this man. The Spirit of God came on him, and he judged Israel and delivered them. We could look at David. Of course, David's life is well known to us. From David, we have him from 1 Samuel all the way through 1 Kings. Chapter 2, we have him in the Psalter. We have him mentioned in the New Testament. The Psalms are quoted, and David is mentioned as a prophet in the New Testament. We're well associated with David, and we could go in his life and plumb the depths of David's faith and see where he put his faith. We could look at Samuel and see how the Lord used him, his faith, and the word of God that he depended on. There, of course, in the book of Samuel, is uh, named in his honor. First and Second Samuel, he begins in First Samuel chapter one, and uh, we find him all the way through to chapter twenty-five. And then he, and then you notice the very last, the seventh thing he mentions there are the prophets. Well, what prophets are we talking about? You did not name, you know, just think of any of the prophets, and you you've got an example. We're going to find out that who he's thinking about in some of these examples that he gives in verse thirty-three. So let's look down there for a second. Verse 33, who through faith, and then he gives 10 items, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Verse 34, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. And then in verse 35, women receive their dead raised to life again. So ten items, and these are, I've called these the victories of faith. And notice the first one, subdued kingdoms. Now all this happened because of faith. Remember the list I gave you last week? We started with Abel. What has faith accomplished? And we went from Abel all the way through to where we were with Rahab last week. What has faith accomplished? We talked about all those things that happened because of faith. Well, this is, this is the writer's own little list. He said, well, I, you know, time's going to fail me, so I could talk about Gideon, Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, and all the rest, but he doesn't. And then he says, these people also saw these things. Kingdom subdued, wrought righteousness, obtained promises. Now, the subdued kingdoms, we could... We could apply that to any of the judges that he mentions because they all were raised up for a time when Israel was oppressed by another kingdom. And in faith, they delivered the people. Specifically, if you want a, a, a concrete example of that, go to Judges chapter 8 and look at verse 28. I think that's the, um, let's see, what, what is that? That's the Gideon example. The end of the Gideon story, it says that, the Midianites were subdued then. From then on, they were subdued. So the kingdoms subdued. That is, they were put down, and they no longer were a problem. They, they wrought righteousness. This one I thought was very interesting. If you go back to Judges chapter 5, you'll find out in Deborah's song, when Deborah and Barak sing their song of victory, they talk about the righteousness of the Lord that was created or that came upon Israel because of this great victory. So to wrought righteous acts, we find happens at least specifically in the experience of Barak and of uh, Deborah. They obtained promises. That is, they were delivered from their troubles. They, and specific troubles. For example, at the Red Sea. You know, they, they were at the Red Sea. Egypt's behind them. The sea's in front of them. And the Lord says, stretch your hand out over the sea and, and tell the children of Israel to march. And that was the word, and he said, you're going to go on dry ground, and you're going to the other side. And the sea opened, and the ground dried up, and they marched across. So they obtained a promise right there. Why? Because they had faith in what God said for them to do. The Egyptians didn't, and that's why they failed. Stop the mouths of lions. Well, if you were to think about who did that, what would you say? It doesn't have to be in the list. Daniel, right, Daniel. Daniel and the lions, the first thing that comes to mind, right? But also Samson, 
Samson, he, remember he slew the lion that roared against him? He stopped his mouth, killed him. Um, and also David, you know, when he reports to Saul, your servant has slain the bear and the lion with his sling. Yeah. So stop the mouths of lions. And notice again, all of this is happening, not because they're extra special people, but because they had faith in what God said. They escaped the edge of the sword. David, in Samuel chapter 23, verse 28, book 1. Out of weakness were made strong. Well, I think of Samson standing there between those two pillars. And he puts his hands on those pillars and he's blind and he's weak. And although his hair had begun to grow again. And he prays to the Lord and asks for favor that he might have his strength once more. And he pushes those pillars over. You remember that? Weakness, he was made strong. But that could also apply to any of these. It could apply to Gideon. It could apply to Barak. It could apply to Jephthah. It could apply to David and Samuel. All of them were made strong out of weakness because we start with weakness. They waxed valiant in fight. I don't know. I just think of Gideon when I read that. The scaredy cat judge. He needed valiant. He needed to be a valorous man. And he was when the Spirit of God came on him. And because of his faith, because he was willing to do what God said, God gave him uh, valor in fight. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Really all that are mentioned and some not mentioned could be uh, put in here. And then verse 35, women received their dead raised to life again. Well, I immediately think of that Shunammite of Elisha. You know, she came running, said all is well when all wasn't well because her son had died. And, of course, also in Elijah's day, the widow of Zarephath, when her son passed. So all of these men and women of God had victories. But they had victories because of their faith. Not because they were special people. Not because of anything. They had victories because they were humble people who believed God and trusted his word. That's why they had victory. And whether you put this list in order or if you turn it on its head, it doesn't matter how it comes out. It's still just a group of ordinary, everyday folks that God used because they believed and had faith in his word. That's it. Now the sermon should be over. But guess what? It's not. Because there's another list of ten things. And these are not victories. Well, at least you would look at them and say... They don't look like victories. As a matter of fact, one commentator that I read, I think it was in the Broadman Bible Commentary, called this a list of horrors, and surely it is. And remember, this is still following the idea of who through faith. But we begin here in 35, and others were. So these people, these others that he's about to mention, had faith... But they didn't have victory, not like the first group. Notice what he says. Tortured, trial of cruel mockings, verse 36. Yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment, verse 37. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. And then... Finally, the tenth thing here in verse 38, they wandered in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. You know, you you read that and you're like, well, wait a minute. What happened to trumpets blowing and walls falling and, you know, armies fleeing and dead being raised? I like that part of the list. I'm going to go back to that. I want to hear about Sarah being given strength to conceive. I want to hear about Abraham having faith to offer Isaac. I, I, want to, I want to know about all of these people that we've talked of, of Jacob and of Joseph and of, and of uh, uh, Joshua and Rahab. I want to know about all those folks. I want to think about those victories in faith. These are not victories. Truth here. Just because you have faith in God's word does not always mean victory, does it? Faith has a price. Some have paid it with their lives, the loss of their possessions, their homes at all. Others were tortured. I think this is a good medicine, a good tonic for the prosperity gospelers today. I wonder if they ever preach this passage. 
When you have faith, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't mean always you're going to have victory in the immediate. Sometimes it means you're going to go right up against the culture, tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. We could look at Fox's Book of Martyrs and see that grand list of martyrs who've given their life for the faith, and there are so many others whose names we don't even know, who have been yet murdered and destroyed in this past century and the current one. Verse 36, others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. I, I thought of Micaiah in First Kings chapter 22, you know, the, the prophet that told, after all the prophets had prophesied to Ahab, they brought in Micaiah because Jehoshaphat wanted to hear a word from the Lord, and Micaiah came in and said, you're going to go up there and you're going to die, and they threw him in prison because of it. Micaiah, he's one. How about stonings? Verse 37, Zechariah in 2 Chronicles chapter 24 was stoned because he kept the word of the Lord. They were sawn asunder. We really don't have a record of that in the scripture, but there's a, a tradition that says Isaiah was sawn asunder by Manasseh. Manasseh made a giant wooden saw, and he sawed the body of the prophet in half. We're tempted were slain with the sword. I think of Uriah, who was put in the heat of the battle, and Jeremiah, who was slain in Egypt by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And then we have this break in this beautiful commentary here by the writer of the Hebrews to the Hebrews, where he says, Of whom the world was not worthy. How true that is! Godly men and women who tread on this soil, ladies and gentlemen, they have a home in heaven, a city to look forward to. They have a glory and a crown that awaits them. They are not worthy. This world is not worthy of them. They are only here for a little while because God will soon take them home. And then we have this 10th verse. They wandered in deserts. Of this 10th statement, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. I think of Elijah when he was on the run from Jezebel. And then we come to verse 39. And all, and these all, the writer says, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Wow. And these all, whether they had victories or whether they had trouble, whether they received horrors because of their faith, or whether they received life-changing victory. Ladies and gentlemen, both lists and these all obtained a good report through faith. Both those who experienced victory with specific promises such as the Hebrews at the Red Sea or like Uriah the Hittite who kept faith and yet was killed Because of it, a good report. This takes us back to verse 2, actually, in this 11th chapter. If you just want to flip back there real quick or look back there real quick. Verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 11. Notice that he begins, and of course we have our, our statement, by faith, or now faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it... The elders obtained a good report. He began the chapter that way. He ends the chapter that way. Faith always produces a good report. And they received not the promise. I got to thinking about that. What what promise is he talking about? The Hebrew evangelist, his logic is so tight that, of course, he's going to leave us a clue someplace. So I began looking through the book of Hebrews for this clue. What promise? And notice that it's, it's the promise promise here. So I found a place where he mentions the promise. It's in Hebrews chapter 6. If you just want to flip back over there real quick. Verse 15. This is speaking of Abraham. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. Now verse 15. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Well, now, wait a minute. It says here in 1139, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. So this promise Abraham did receive. So this is not talking about that particular promise. 
So where else could the Hebrew evangelist mention that? Well, if you look over in chapter 9, verse 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this cause he is the mediator of a new testament, of the new testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that are under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. There it is. The promise is what? It's not an earthly inheritance. No. It's not earthly possessions. No. It's an, it's an eternal inheritance. But not only that, if you look at um, the 10th chapter, so you're in 9, just go one chapter more, chapter 10, and in verse 36, you'll read this. Chapter 10, verse 36, For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. There it is again. And what promise is that? Eternal inheritance. Huh. So, the, the promise that they didn't receive was eternal inheritance. The promise that we might receive is eternal inheritance. Now, I'm going to go outside of Hebrews just for a second because I think our friend John says it the best in his first epistle in chapter 2. He says this. This is the promise. He says in verse 25 of his second chapter. This is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. So there is an eternal promise. You know who can give an eternal promise? Only an eternal person. God has promised an inheritance. He has promised life. He has promised something to us in Christ Jesus that, ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity to receive Because we are in Christ. We go back now to Hebrews chapter 11. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Why is it? How come they didn't receive eternal inheritance? How come they did not receive eternal life? Because everything that they had up to that point, up to their believing, was that Jesus was coming. There was a Messiah. There was something more. All the sacrifices, all the furnishings, all the priesthood, all the, all the offerings, all the feast days, everything pointed to Messiah. And they hadn't received him yet. He hadn't come. And then one day he's going to come and he's going to die on a cross. And it's no longer going to be the blood of bulls and goats, but now it's going to be the blood of the Son of God. And that blood will be offered once. And once that blood is offered, the way then will be made open to God, and there will be access to eternal inheritance. That is why the Hebrew evangelist ends this chapter with verse 40. God having provided something better for us, He provided for us the Lord Jesus. We look back to Him. We look back to that sacrifice and we say, thank God, one time, one sacrifice for me. How horrible will it be? Would it be if I had to go every single day and make an offering of a bull or a goat or some animal to God for blood sacrifice to cleanse me from sin? I could never do it. There would never be enough time. There would never be enough bloodshed. All but once, that better thing that came to me was the sacrifice of my Savior. Oh, thank God for that. And now I have an eternal inheritance. That's the something better that he's talking about. God having provided. Thank God he provided. Who among us could have provided that? Not one. You by your good works will never, ever provide entrance into an eternal inheritance. Ever. There's no way. You can't do it. It's not possible. You're not strong enough, smart enough. You don't live long enough. You're not good enough. There's no righteousness in you. You are dead in trespasses and sins. The Old Testament worthies have done all that they could without our advantage. We, the elect, the bride of Christ, the church of the firstborn, have experienced a transforming power in conversion. We have been given the Holy Ghost. We have the teachings of the apostles and the prophets to guide us. And yet, these all died in faith. They did it. Without our benefit. They did it without our something better. 
So the Hebrew evangelist's reason now for giving this, this chapter is evident. He did it to encourage us. If they could do it, just think what you can do. Just think what your faith can do. You have advantage because that something better that God has provided is available right now. It gives us a foot up. It gives us strength. There's something better here. In chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews, the apostle writes this. He says in verse 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. There it is. And then notice verse 14, just down from there. For by one offering hath he perfected forever them that are sanctified. You want to look at something better? You look right there. That's something better. And that's what we've received. So what's the point? His point is, let us hold fast our confession. Do you remember, I started this whole thing back in chapter 10 with the three lettuce leaves of chapter 10. You remember those? Beginning there in verse 22. Verse 22, let us draw near. This is the first lettuce leaf with a true heart and full assurance of faith there's faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience our bodies washed with pure water number two let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised verse 23 ladies and gentlemen is i mean when you read that after having read hebrews chapter 11 it makes perfect sense let us hold fast the profession of our faith yes And then he gives us this long list of faithful men and women who did it without our advantage. Yes, let us hold fast the profession of faith. For he who promised is faithful, absolutely. These guys knew it, and they didn't have the Holy Ghost. These guys knew it, and they didn't have the apostles teaching in the doctrine of the prophets. These guys knew it, and they didn't have the church of the living God in this earth. They didn't have any of that advantage. They didn't know the Lord Jesus. They hadn't experienced conversion in the new birth. They didn't have any of that. And yet they did it. They did it because they knew God was worthy, that he was promised, his promises were sure. See? So let us hold fast the confession of our faith, for he that promised is faithful. Well, it just makes all the sense in the world now when you read verse 23. You understand what he's been after the whole time. He wants the church to walk in faith. Verse 36 of chapter 10, For ye have need of patience after... Ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. We've already mentioned that, but there it is again. If they could do it, what about you? What about me? What are you putting your faith in? I, I think we talk a lot about faith. We don't practice it very much as believers. You know, we put our faith in the Lord Jesus when we come to him for salvation. We experience the new birth, and that jazzes us up. But then life happens, and we kind of forget We go about our life and do things as normal. What if we could actually put our faith in God's word for something and just stay there with it and just trust God for that thing? What difference would that make in your life? If you let go of all of the connections, of all of the dependencies on other things and other people, and you actually put your faith in God's word, about something. I don't know what it is. Maybe the Spirit of God is speaking to you right now about what He wants you to do with this. He's telling you, you need to place your faith in the word for, and that's between you and Him. But what if? I think that's the thing. The writer of the Hebrews would, if he were standing behind this pulpit this morning, he would plainly tell us, don't let the confession of your faith slip Be faithful, hold on to it, keep going. These did it, and they didn't have all that you have. What if, what if you put your faith in the word? What would the outcome be? It might be victory. It might be torment. But either way, what a glorious life. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.